Right, I'm going to get started. Um, thanks very much for um, attending this uh, monthly market webinar with me, Michael Houston, and Colin Szynski. Hi, everybody. Um, this, is Hi everybody. this is just generally a Q&A um, where Colin and I basically go through the various markets, um, look at the trends, um, look at the drivers of the trends, and really, I think, try and, try and pick a direction for the next move in the markets. Now, before I get started, um, I'll allow you all to peruse the risk warnings um, for the various jurisdictions, namely UK, um, Canada, and Ireland, and wherever else you happen to uh, happen to be listening in from. And once I've done that, I will basically jump these out of the way. I think one of the one of the good things about these webinars, Colin, is coming on the back so closely off the back of non-farm payrolls. Um, it gives us a chance to really digest what we saw last week, which was an okay jobs number, but um, the revision lower was a little bit troubling. And once again, we've seen a fairly positive number from the U.S. jobs market, but a very poor number from U.S. retail sales. And yeah, a poor we're not getting confirmation from anything else. Uh, I really, I, in terms of you know, with the retail sales, and you know, we talked about durable goods. And, mm. and some of the others, it's really interesting that we're seeing the the, the jobs are, are, are had a nice rebound, but but really nothing else has in any uh, in any meaningful way yet. And anything related to to consumer spending in particular has still come in quite soft of late. And which is all the more surprising when you consider what inflation is doing. Those PPI numbers um, that we saw earlier this afternoon were very very weak. Um, minus 0.2, and we're expecting a positive number there. So once again, you know, it does, I think, back the Fed into a corner, you know, with respect to what it can do with interest rates. So, you know, I mean, we've got we've got a we've got a June meeting coming up. I think we can all safely assume that they're not really going to do anything at that meeting. But I think it's also pushing the prospect of a weak Q2. And that's going to make it very, very difficult for the Fed to even consider hiking in September. Whether or not you have a different view on that is another matter. But I know it's certainly my... looking that way to me. I don't see how they can do it before September at least. If, if Q2 stays, because I think they're going to have to uh, raise their uh, their growth forecast before they before they start raising interest rates, and because uh, they cut them in March, and mm. uh, and, and at this rate they, we may not see them uh, raise them in June either. And and, and the other thing that uh, that well, concerns can me they? with the Fed, you... mm. the other way. Mm -hmm. is that they are painting themselves into a corner where we're down at uh, we've had 3 weeks in a row now of of substantially below 300,000 uh, jobless claims so you've got the employment markets going apparently really well for them but um at the uh, you know at the same time then what happens if uh, if things suddenly start to go the other way and soften on them mm. they've got absolutely no firepower whatsoever with all the uh, left after uh, after all the QE programs and zero interest rates so they really are getting themselves stuck between a rock and a hard place here I, I'm thinking and the three month average for jobs is 190 thousand so and that's the first time that it's dropped below 200 thousand. Um, since the beginning of 2014, so that that, that that again feeds into the narrative of what I would suggest is a slightly weakening job market, particularly if you look at the ADP numbers as well, where since the peaks that we saw in November, each subsequent month has been slightly weaker than the previous month. So while we've been adding jobs, it's been at a much lower rate, and that's really been reflected, I think, in the S&P. We look at this chart in front of us here, and we're in a range. We're not going anywhere. Um, the top of the range is 2120. The bottom of the range is, I would suggest, probably 2075, 2085. On the wide of it, you're looking at 2035. You know, at the moment, I think investors are very, very um, unsure about the next move for U.S. markets. And I think if you actually look at this this particular chart here, the Dow is fairly similar as well. It's pretty unremarkable. In the Nasdaq as well, and, and I think what you're you're running into this time, it's it's a little different. Is that in, in the past you'd have um, if you came in with a weakening U.S. economy, well, people would go, great, lovely. It means the Fed will come in with more QE or, or delay tapering or, or whatever, and and keep the liquidity piling in. But but this time around, there's no sign of the new liquidity piling in. So when people are seeing the bad news now, instead of uh, 
or, or weaker news, instead of saying, great, we'll keep the liquidity party going, drive the market higher, instead it's like, oh, well, what does this mean for corporate earnings? And, and what does this mean for valuations? And, and we've probably reached a point where, for now, the, the valuations have kind of gotten stretched, and, the, mm-hmm. and the, with the, the no new liquidity, at, at the very least, even if they don't raise interest rates, it doesn't look like they're likely to come in with a QE4 either. So the market's kind of topped out here. And then on the bottom side, the, the economy has slowed, but it's not crashing either. So you do have some fundamental support uh, as well, and, and you end up stuck in a, in a trading range. And it's not uncommon that we've had these. The, uh, the last one was in 0405, and, and the previous one was in 9495. And we do, you do kind of get these in, in what I call kind of mid-cycle, where when the central banks start pulling back on the liquidity and people are figuring out is the economy really strong enough to stand on its own or what have you. But the point is these things can go on for the better part of a year. Or so And we're, if I go back to February, we're about three months in now. So we probably go, we could have another, uh, we could see this go on right through the summer. Yeah, I certainly think um, I certainly think that's um, a valid assessment. You compare that though to what we've been seeing um, in the U.S. bond markets, and actually, it's quite similar in terms of the range that we've been. If if we look at, say, for example, the ten-year, I'm struck by how similar the prices have been relative to the stock market. You know, again, we're in a range in terms of the U.S. Treasury ten-year yield. Uh, which suggests to me that in, you know U.S. interest rate expectations are fairly stable, even though markets are trying to second guess as to when we're going to get you know a, a Fed rate rise. Um, you know, you and I have disagreed about the timing of, of, a, of a Fed rate rise. You know, for the past five months, I, I, I'm still of the opinion they won't do anything this year. Um, you know, your, your comment about the fact that. Um, they won't move on rates or won't give a signal on rates until they upgrade their inflation or growth forecasts, I think is a very valid one, which suggests to me that there isn't a meeting between June and September, which means that if they don't do it in June, i.e. move their forecasts, and given the fact that we've just seen a fairly weak um, payroll number for April, um, they're only going to have visibility on just one more payrolls number, and that's the May one in early June. They're not likely to change them on the basis of one payrolls number, are they? So that would then suggest to me that they would have to then revise their forecast up in September, and they're not going to move on rates at the same time as moving on their forecasts. Yeah, that's right. I mean, it's pretty unlikely. That's the way I figure it is that they would probably signal by changing their forecasts first and then, uh, and then and go then, in there. And then so do you're it for the following meeting, yeah, which so would be the end of October. October or December. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and then you've so, got the speakers out there arguing over, well, do we move sooner and take our time, or do we go later and act more aggressively? They're still churning through, trying to churn through that as well. And, and it, it, you know, the one thing I notice in all of this is that the market's not really reacting to it anymore. You know, in the past, we know, we, we know the uh, you'd hear tons of talk about well, you know, this Fed governor said this and this Fed governor said that, and you know, and and it would spark some fairly significant moves in the markets. And now, the of late, the the market, the 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 reaction to all of this has been has been much more muted, where the market is like is almost like okay, let us know when you're ready to raise them. <laughs> and I think that's really being reflected in the move in the euro against the dollar. The dollar's weakening mm-hmm. because I think the market's starting to push that out. But I think what's more interesting, and this is something that I've covered in my videos recently, is the sharp correlation that we've been seeing with respect to the German DAX, the German Bund, and the euro dollar. Mm-hmm. I mean, what we've seen here, if we look at the daily chart, I don't, don't know how many of you can actually see this, but this is, this is the daily chart. If we change it to a weekly chart here, we've got a very strong downward move on the weekly candle right here, right in there. This, this down move here where you can see my, my cursor, that's very bearish. We've got the tweezer top. We've taken out the lows of the previous two weeks here. If we then change this to a monthly candle, it's even more nasty in terms of what we've got there. A, a bearish reversal on the German DAX. Okay, so we've got that. Now if we look at the German Bund, and it's a similar sort of story, again, even more marked, 
Um, and it's important to understand what's happening here. We've had seen a significant sell-off in German bunds, which is pushing German yields higher relative to U.S. yields. So basically what it's doing is it's actually making it less attractive to hold dollars relative to euros. If we also look at the bund chart on a monthly chart, we have got a fairly similar outcome here in terms of the bearish monthly reversal which would suggest then to me that that's going to be fairly positive for the euro in terms of the yield differentials. So I've looked at that. That particular chart is pushing down, which suggests that we could well see further losses on German bunds, therefore higher yields, which should be euro positive. If we now look at euro dollar monthly chart, again, we've seen a break higher, but we look at the monthly chart, Again, a bullish, a bullish reversal in this case, which would seem to suggest we're going to get a break higher in the short to medium term. And we did get an initial um, indicator that that might happen beginning of February, um, sorry, beginning of March. Now we've broken higher. If we can now look at the saved chart that I've got here, which is the four hour chart, we can see that we've ratcheted this move up quite nicely on the four hour chart. And our, and our initial channel higher is now broken above the channel, and it's now basically drawing itself, finding support, support at the upper at the upper upper end of that line there. So if I just redraw that, because sometimes these lines do t have a tendency to need redrawing, if I draw that there, snapping on the low, snapping on the low, there, and then snapping through those levels there, you can see that. We're running into a little bit of resistance at the moment. We are overbought. I've put in a horizontal line up here as a bit of a guidance threshold for us. We can see that coincides with the February peaks. So we're going to get a little bit of a little bit of resistance in the short to medium term, but we still remain well away from the 200-day moving average. That suggests to me that overall, I think we've seen the lows in euro dollar in the short term. And the bias now remains very much a case of buying dips on euro dollar, buying dips on the pound against the dollar, or, or alternatively looking at another way, selling rallies on any dollar gains. Um, so, and that's really that nice climb up out of a double bottom too. When you look back yeah. at the daily chart, that's a pretty solid oh, double that, bottom. Absolutely there. through here. And channels now excellent. obviously. So if you've got a double bottom, the measuring objective really is from the lows to the highs, and you project that higher. Well, that's 110. That's 105, give or take. That's 500 points. So we're pretty much almost all the way there to around about 115. So we pretty much hit. You're off on the uh, – sorry, you're getting overbought in the stochastics and you're approaching yeah. the measured objective probably yeah. tells you at some point you might need a bit of a pause or maybe a bit of a pullback, but you're right. I mean, this does look like a, uh, a definitely a solid trend of higher lows. And I think when you're, talk, when you're talking about things like that, it's important to look for confirmation. And I think that's why I've looked at the Bund and the topping pattern there, which suggests to me that yields aren't probably going to go down that much more you know, in, in, in German bond markets, which then really sort of throws into question the, the, the yield differentials with respect to German bonds and U.S. Treasuries. And I think it's very important to um, understand the relationship between yield differentials when you're trading something like Euro-Dollar, because when, 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 the yield, when the yield differential widens in favor of one currency over another, you usually get more, more more currency flow into the higher yielding currency, or not necessarily the higher yielding currency, but as as the yield differential narrows, you start to get an adjustment process take place in favour of either the narrowing or the widening of the differential. And I think you can really make that distinction quite nicely if we look at my Bloomberg here. And I think this is why it's it's very very important in the context of what we're looking at in terms of um, government bond yield differentials. If I look at this page here, hopefully you guys can see this and you'll understand where I'm coming from. 
This is the current yield differential between German 10-year and U.S. 10-year. It's 154 basis points in favor of U.S. Treasuries. That in itself is not the important number. What's important is the direction of travel and this bottom chart here, which is the spread, which I'm now going to put on the chart in front of you there. Now, if you see this 190 basis points level here, that level there coincides with when euro dollar was at 104.50. So that's basically when yields were widest in favor of the dollar and against the euro. What we can see here, ladies and gentlemen, is the fact this differential is starting to narrow in favor of the euro. Therefore, it's pushing the euro higher. So if this differential continues to move lower, it's going to support the euro relative to the US dollar. And this is what I've been looking at over the past two to three weeks, two to three months, in fact, to try and derive a direction for euro dollar. And at the moment, you can see this trend here. Um, it is definitely moving in the euro's favor. Yes, there are 154 basis points in favor of the US dollar in terms of the yield differential, but it's narrowed quite considerably from where we were when euro dollar hit 104.50. And we've taken out these lows through here, which suggests that we've certainly got more scope to come in more, more positive in terms of the euro. You got anything you want to add to that, Colin? Yeah, I wanted to talk a little bit. I thought we could talk a little bit as to why that's the case and, and why it peaked back at the uh, beginning of February, because I find that peak really interesting. It's right around the time the ECB started their quantitative easing program, and I've been tracking this on a weekly basis. And so if, if you went with what the ECB said, we're going to do 60 billion euros a month would be 15 billion a week, right? But if you yeah. say, okay, fine, well, it's, uh, there's actually 13 weeks and a quarter, and, and you have 180 billion over 13 weeks works out to about 13.8 billion they've been running at 12.0 so the ECB mm. bond buying has been running below expectations and and the other side is I, I'm, I'm increasingly thinking this at least for the, the last little while that uh, that Greece is continuing to be noise my thinking is the drivers that this uh, that this uh, QE program has not been as uh, not been coming in as uh, as strong as people thought it was going to be and uh, and that they've been uh, that they've been telling the world they've been buying less bonds and that's what i suspect is is has been driving this uh the rebound in the euro the the drop in the yield spread and uh, but maybe there's other factors that i haven't thought of as well do you have any thoughts michael well there is i mean i think it's a case of you know sort of sell the rumor by the fact um they've been front running this qe program since the beginning of 2014 and the market's got ahead of the fact and it's pretty much all priced in. Now, U.S. 10-year, sorry, German 10-year yields were at 0.05%, and most of the German yield curve was negative. We've seen a rally in oil prices, which would seem to suggest that these concerns about deflation that everyone was worried about are overblown, and that's why you've seen yields start to rise, simply because I think the concerns that a lot of people had about deflation in the euro area were overpriced. And now you're seeing a realignment in people's expectations, and that's why you're seeing a sell-off in German bunds, and that's why you're seeing euro push higher, because people's expectations that we were going to see um, a significant amount of deflation in the euro area aren't being borne out in the economic data that we've been seeing coming out. That's not to say that you know Europe is going to come rebounding back like a lion out of a cage, but what, what I am thinking is that maybe we're, people were pricing in far too much deflation relative to what we're seeing. And I think that, combined with the rebound in the oil price, has caused an awful lot of people to take some of that risk off the table, and that's pushed bonds down, and that's pushed yields up and narrowed the differential between U.S. Treasuries and the 10-year. And more importantly, I think there has been significant indications that the U.S. dollar really, I think, has run out of steam. U.S. economic data is softening, so the attraction of the U.S. dollar is starting to diminish. So I think you've got a bit of a push-pull going on in terms of interest rate expectations in Europe and interest rate expectations in the U.S., and that's what's basically sending the dollar higher, sorry, dollar lower after the, the massive gains that we've seen in the past 12 months. It's a similar sort of story if we look on the Australian dollar as well. If we look on the Absolutely. monthly chart on the Australian dollar, 
it's an even bigger monthly reversal there. Again, it's a bullish engulfing, it's a key reversal day, and that suggests to me that I think there's more risk of the Australian dollar going back to 90 than going back down to the lows that we saw um, at the, at, you know, in the middle of last month. It's not just the Australian dollar that's showing us these sorts of reversals, it's the euro dollar. It's also the, the pound against the dollar. And when you get a whole host of charts telling you the same thing, um, incomplete yeah, against the dollar too. Um, yeah, pretty much everything except in, in in the region Krona too. Pretty much the only one that's been soft has been the uh, the Kiwi dollar, and even they've shown signs of life, but they're looking at a, at a rate cut. Yeah, exactly. So everybody, a lot of the dollars are, are are and resource currencies are all turning. They've all been turning higher as well. Absolutely. And when you've got all of those indicators and people still saying they think the dollar's going to go higher, that tells me that people are the wrong way around. They're talking their book. Um, but they essentially want, want – and when you've got position values like that, it also tells me that people are the wrong way around. You know, you've got 83% of the cash position in Aussie dollar, short of Aussie – um, long of dollars. If we look at the same thing with respect to euro dollar, again, we're looking at a very similar story. 80% top clients, sh cash positions are short euros. That's not to say they're wrong, but it just tells me that the market, I think, is overly bullish on the dollar and overly bearish um, mm -hmm. on everything else. And when that happens, I tend to start to worry about the fact that people are too one way, you know, and we've got the election out of the way. And again, I think that had an awful lot of people short of sterling. And once again, I think people are the wrong way around. I think they were overly concerned about the prospect of a Labour government, yet the markets weren't pricing that in. You know, if we looked at what Cable was doing over the course of the last few weeks, even before um, last week's vote, it was showing signs that it had bottomed out, which I thought was, was strange, given how much uncertainty there was around the polls. But look at, look at this bear, bullish reversal on the weekly charts that we saw four or five weeks ago. That was telling me that the pound was looking very well supported, despite the fact that there was a prospect we could get a Labour government. And that rang alarm bells for me. It told me, it told me that if we did get in any way conclusive result, we were going to get a move higher. And that's exactly what we got. So, you know, in terms of the dollar story, we're now above the 5,100 and 200 day moving average on the cable for the first time since the Scottish referendum. That, for me, is fundamentally bullish. And that also suggests to me that, you know, as long as we stay above, um, you know, sort of 154, 155, then we could well go to 160, which, you know, every fibre of my being tells me is wrong but the charts don't lie. Or yeah, the charts here are telling us that the U.S. dollar is into a, into a pretty serious correction here. I mean, it had such a, a relentless move last year against pretty much everything that, that we're now into, I think, a pretty solid uh, uh, counter-trend reversal here. I mean, we've got the, uh, the U.S. dollar index back down under, uh, under 95, 94 now. I mean, it could easily retest 90 at least. It's, uh, it's, it's quite, a, uh, quite a pullback we're starting to get in the, uh, in the dollar index here. And look yeah, at that I mean, double we, top, and then just the bottom's just falling right out from under it. Yeah, I mean, we can have a quick look at the dollar index, I think, on, on the Bloomberg, which, I, which I'm going to pull across in a minute. So you, you carry on talking, Colin, and I'll just call this up, and then we can have a look sure. at the dollar index. Sure. So we had a major rally in the U.S. dollar, and, and that was uh, basically driven by uh, by two things. One was expectations that the Fed would start raising interest rates in June. That's pretty clear that that's not going to happen. And uh, and then of course we saw other things uh, collapsing all around it. So there was. Um, you know, there was concerns about the UK election. There was concerns about what's going to happen with Europe and, and pricing in a, a big QE program. And there was the collapse in the oil prices and other commodity prices drove all the, uh, the uh, resource dollars down. So you ended up with it was like this, this golden moment for the US dollar and a perfect storm for everybody else. And we had this huge rally in the dollar. And that's pretty much started in, say, last summer, about the time crude oil started heading south. And 
you know, kaboom, that's like nine months, just solid straight uptrend, a double top, and now you're seeing it start to go back. And yeah, you know, Michael, you could almost even make a case that this could be a head and a head and shoulders with a uh, shoulder mm. in May, a shoulder in January, and a double top head. And basically, that's looking uh, any way you slice it, that's looking pretty awful. It is, and, and, and ready for a, a good serious retrenchment. This for me, I think 93.40 on the dollar index equates to around about 115 euro dollar. I think when you look at the dollar index, you've got to be aware that it's it comprises about 57% euro dollar. So there is a significant correlation um, between the dollar index and the euro dollar to the to the tune of around about 55. If we change this also to a weekly chart we can see again there was a little bit of a reversal there but if we then change it to a monthly chart I think it's even more notable look at that look that is that. a significant bearish reversal on the dollar index now we've seen them before we saw one here and we saw a significant decline we saw a little bit of a one here if we blend those two candles and again we saw a significant decline over the course of the next few months so that for me is a warning sign that we're going to see further declines in the dollar index over the course of the next five to six months. Now it's five to six months. It's important to you know, articulate that we're not going to see it over the next two or three weeks. We're going to see an awful lot of noise in between. But I think overall, as long as euro dollar stays above one ten and a half um, and we get a pullback from where we are now, I think you know, any dips are probably a fairly decent buy, a low risk buying opportunity certainly on the basis of that chart anyway. All right, before um, Colin and I move on to other assets, ladies and gents, do you have any questions about um, a market that we haven't covered yet? Otherwise, what we're going to do now is we're going to go on to crude oil prices and then we're going to go on to, to gold prices because mm. crude oil has actually also been fairly interesting as well. Sorry about that. I think I've just gone and got rid of... There it is. We're back again. Back in the room. So... Crude oil prices, um, I have the opinion that potentially we may have seen a top. What's your view? Actually, I think we're, uh, we may be actually, we've had a pretty good run here, and, uh, and it's crude oil is starting to look a little more uh, weaker to me technically. And, and there's a couple of things going on. So we've had a huge run in the crude oil price. The crude oil prices can, can benefit from, the, some, from some of the weakening in the U.S. dollar, but, uh, but something we've got to watch for here is, you know, basically we had a massive, massive sell-off in crude oil. We've had a... Uh, a significant, well, we can call it a, a trading bounce, a counter trend rally here, uh, an upward correction, whatever we want to call it. But at some point, it looks like we're maybe starting to run out of gas, and there's a, there's a few things that uh, that are going on. And uh, if we look, just look at it from the the fundamental side for a second, we had you know people expecting that. Um, that U.S. inventories were going to build forever. Now, now U.S. inventories have started to to level off and come back down a little bit. But the most important thing is to pay attention to is people have been saying, well, U.S. Dr uh, drilling activity has gone down, U.S. production has gone down, and that's going to boost the price of crude oil. But there's there's one big problem with that, which is that the Saudis have increased their production more than the U.S. has cut theirs. So the uh, and, and in the last couple of days, the International Energy Agency came out and basically said that. And, and overnight, the, the Saudis have been going around clucking, saying basically, we're winning the market share war. We've driven out the, the higher cost U.S. production and, and replaced it with ourselves. And, and the bottom line is that, uh, that overall crude market supply has not gone down. This uh, price war is going to go on for a long time so then and and if crude oil does start going up much farther you do run into the risk of how long is it going to take for the uh, the u.s shale producers to figure out oh the uh, uh basically that the uh, the saudis have uh, have done a number on us and um and basically we should just go ahead with anything that's profitable and uh, and so at some point i think you are going to see this uh this turn again and we are starting to see signs and if we look back to uh, the, the top one, and actually Michael's highlighted it here, the Gravestone Doji and the Evening Star, which uh, are, uh, I th is, it looks like it's the topping under yeah. the pattern and coinciding with an overbought stochastic. So maybe you want to talk about that a little more, Michael? 
Yeah, I mean, as I say, we've got the evening star formation here with the Greystone Doji. Now, we have had a little bit of a pullback, and the thing with these patterns is these patterns require confirmation. They're not hard and fast. So for me, the bottom of the Greystone Doji formation is this horizontal line through here around about $63 a barrel. So what we need to do is we need to stay below these two peaks here, this peak here and this peak here, for this pattern to unfold. So we need to come lower and we need to break down through here towards this long-term trend line over here. The thing with candlestick patterns is, unlike specifically with respect to a combination of candles like this, is they require confirmation. So they're not as strong in terms of the signals that they give out. Let's say something like a bullish engulfing pattern, a key reversal day, a bearish engulfing pattern, and a key reversal day. They're not, they're not as strong. They need confirmation. So what you're looking for on a pattern like this is a break through here. Okay, so a break below this line to suggest that we've seen a short-term top and a move down towards this line here and potentially even lower through here. I don't think we're going to come crashing off, but there's also an additional factor at play in here with respect to crude prices. There's an OPEC meeting next month, mm -hmm. and what we've seen this morning is that the non-OPEC members, like Venezuela, um, Russia, um, and Iran and Iraq, um, have ramped up production quite significantly simply because they need the hard currency. And we've seen, we've seen that reflected in the way the ruble has recovered against the US dollar as well. So it's all very well for the Saudis to basically turn around and saying they've raised prices um, now that um, they think they've seen off US shale producers, but also you're not factoring in the non-OPEC producers who are not bound by the OPEC quotas. So we have, a, we have an OPEC meeting in June, and I think what we're going to see there is probably not dissimilar to what we've seen over the past few months, in that the Saudis will sit on their hands. And, you know, you can certainly see that borne out in the uncertainty or the corridor of uncertainty that we've got in Brent crude prices here between 63 and $68 a barrel. But also, if we look at WTI, it's a similar sort of story on the WTI chart here. And you can see that the candles have reacted in a slightly different way, which is why it's always important to, to say the, these, these sorts of patterns need confirmation. So you can see where the big support level is on the WTI. It's basically around $57.50 right through those series of lows through there. So we haven't quite taken out that high, but obviously what we have we have got here is some we have some form of selling pressure around about sixty one, sixty two dollars a barrel and it would take a move through those highs to suggest that we're going to kick on higher. So markets are a little bit worried about being overly long crude oil at these levels. So, Reed, and interestingly, so we, I'm also looking here at a bit of a double, possible double top there above 61 yeah. on the shadows, and of course a rollover in the uh, in the stochastics tells you your upward momentum is starting to uh, weaken as well. So we are at a point where we've had a great run up in, in crude, which is which is wonder, which is nice, and it certainly has helped to take some of the pressure off some of the uh, the crude producing areas and, and the crude producing currencies. But uh, but at the same time, we're not looking at a situation where this is ready to go back to, to 100 or, or even 80 or even 75. At some point, it, we're, we're getting to a point where it could potentially start to uh, level off and, and go back the other way. Because after this kind of a, a generational crash that we had, which was the first time we've really seen it, it driven by a, by a supply war since 1986, it wasn't over in a few months. It took years for the oil market to, uh, to sort itself out. And I think that's going to be the same thing again. You can get some pretty substantial moves clearly up and down within it, and you could get you know, $20 trend, trend moves, but, uh, but it's not a uh, you know, happy days are here again scenario. This is more of a uh, we've had a big sell-off. We've had a, a basically a, an upward correction, and, uh, and at some point that's going to run into gas and either you level off or, or start going back the other way again. But, uh, but certainly this whole supply war situation is, uh, is really just getting started in my opinion. Yeah, I think we're just stabilizing at slightly higher levels after, yeah. the, after the sharp sell-off. And 
gold's quite interesting in that we've ratcheted higher. Let me just get rid of that line because it's pretty old now and it doesn't really um, add anything to the overall analysis. But certainly I think the break above these peaks is trying to break out here, which again feeds into the weaker dollar narrative. If we can basically draw a line through there, that's 12.25. I mean, we do have peaks here between um, 12.33, but certainly I think what we're seeing here, given this last three days, we've seen a very strong short squeeze in gold prices. And I think there was a story out um, earlier today about uh, Germans buying gold coins en masse over concern that a Greek default um, or a forthcoming Greek default could actually de destabilize monetary union, which I think is probably um, slightly overstating things, but I, I certainly think at some point um, we are getting very close to an end game on Greece. And while the euro doesn't appear to be reflecting that uncertainty, I certainly think that um, you know, at some point over the next two or three weeks, we could get some form of resolution. And even if we don't, I think they're merely dis I think they're merely delaying the inevitable. Which yeah, is a Greek point in time, it's which is a Greek default. Yeah, I think at this point in time, the Greek the, the Greece is they're just so far uh, in debt. And I mean, the the solutions that were proposed four years ago to uh, to improve things so that they could pay their debt only made things worse. So it, it, to me, it's only a matter of time before they uh, yeah before they have to do a default and people have to take serious uh, serious write downs, even regardless of whether they they actually end up leaving the euro or not. Mm -hmm. We got a bit of a bit of a breakout here as well on um, on the silver. silver. Silver and had a huge move up. We had a huge move up on silver, and my colleague Jasper has done a video on that, which is now on the CMC Markets YouTube channel, which you can all have a look at and um, get Jasper's take on what's happening with silver. It's um, at youtube.com forward slash CMC Markets PLC, where we post all of our videos and where we will be posting a recording of this um, of this webinar uh, once we've um, once we've concluded it, but certainly we've we've got a bit of a breakout um, on the on the 200-day moving average traded above that for the first time since July last year. So from a technical point of view, that could be a leading indicator for a break higher in gold. So certainly worth keeping an eye on that as well. Um, Colin, is there anything else you want me to add before we um, uh, look at anything else? Uh, no, these are good uh, at this point. Uh, actually, I'd just be curious because I haven't looked at them myself. Can we take a quick peek at platinum? Platinum, yeah, sure. I haven't looked at that in a while, I have to say. All right, what's going on here? So it's been fairly quiet. It, it, I mean, it started to pick up a little bit. You could uh, you could make a case it's trying to break out of a uh, out of a downtrend here, but and, uh, let's just put some moving averages on that. Yeah, let's put some color on it because I always think these moving averages. Because I look at platinum quite... sometimes as well for uh, for confirmation that of uh, renewed interest in precious metals, and uh, and so far it's been in the downtrend, so it hasn't moved up quite as quick because sometimes it trades like an industrial metal and sometimes it trades like a precious metal. It, uh, well, it's a bit like depends. silver. Silver does yeah. that as well. Yeah. Um, well, I was right, actually, uh, actually, that's the trend line I was just kind of seeing in my head there, the one you just drew. It does look like it's trying to break out here. I think it has. Let's change it to a weekly chart. Yeah. That's just so starting what, to break what, out as well. Yeah, it's not conclusive, but it's certainly worth keeping an eye on that particular one. Um, there was actually something that I was looking at earlier this week with respect to um, the Nikkei. The Nikkei, in particular, I think um, some of the Hong Kong markets. Look what we've got here, ladies and gents. Potentially, only potentially, I might add, we've got potential head and shoulders reversal forming here. We've had a very strong up move throughout 2015. At the moment, at the moment, there's nothing to see here. 
what we've got is potentially a head and shoulders. We've got the left shoulder here, we've got a small little peak there, and we've got a right shoulder potentially forming here. First indication that momentum was starting to fail here was when we broke this uptrend line from the lows in 2015. Mm -hmm. Now we're starting to track lower, albeit very, very slowly, but what we've got is a potential neckline through here, and what we're looking for is for confirmation of a head and shoulders reversal will be a break lower through this trend line here. Now at the moment, we are we are struggling to make any headway one way or the other. We've traded above 20,000. That's proved to be a bit of a barrier. I think there is a significant prospect that um, you know we could carry on trading sideways for quite some time. But certainly overall on the downside, I will be keeping an eye on this particular neckline here, um, given given some of the um, hysteria, for want of a better word, about Asian equity markets. And there was, there was an, talking about Asian equity markets, in particular the Australian ASX 2000, the All Ordinaries. Look at this here. We've had a double top breakout on the All Ordinaries. Three or four attempts to break above 6,000. We've broken below it the end of last week. We've bounced off the 200-day moving average, and at the moment we're finding resistance between 5,700 and 5,750. Now, if this is a classic double top breakout, then you've got 6,000, 5,750, 250 points. The target is down here at 5,500. I've basically taken this move, projected it from the breakout point downwards. That's our minimum price objective. At the moment, the 200-day moving average is supporting it. We've rebounded off it. What we don't want to see happen here is us to break back into this price corridor, otherwise it negates our downward objective. So at the moment, the ASX looks as if we could be set for another move lower. What could cause that? A weaker US dollar and a stronger Aussie. Certainly worth keeping an eye on. Or a rebound in commodity prices, one of the two. So there's a number of, there's a, there's a number of very nice patterns either started to form or in the process of forming or that have completed over the past three or four weeks. So, you know, it's been, it's been quite exciting watching some of this stuff play out because it's playing out an awful lot in the way that I expected it would. Yeah, we're really seeing a lot of the, uh, the uh, you know, these are some pretty substantial uh, trend reversal patterns that are, are forming here, whether we're looking at, at, at quadruple tops and uh, and double bottoms, and, 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 and a lot of these signs, are they're just showing that we kind of, while well, stocks have kind of gone sideways in, in the U.S. and other markets are starting to roll over, it does seem as though this whole big trends that we've had, particularly through late 2014, early 2015, are now starting to reverse themselves uh, as we head into the, uh, into the summer here. And yeah, actually, exactly. also, Michael, could you bring up the, uh, the Hang Seng, please? The Hong Kong I can one? indeed, yep. Because that's that a whole other one that was just screaming recently and now has started to roll back over. It looks, it looks, just so, this, toppy. It's not, it looks so toppy, it's not true. That. It's yeah. like a little hat. Yeah. Like a yes, little hat. really, because it had that explosive move up. I, that was on the um, that was kind of market driven. That was uh, increased um, increased trading back and forth between Hong Kong and Shanghai. They, Shanghai, they yeah. loosened up some of the uh, the, some connect. Of the restrictions and they yeah, improved the, connect, the connection. That's all, yeah. Yeah. And so that's what caused that that massive rally there. But now, if you look at it, it does look like a pretty serious top forming there in the in the Hong Kong. Yeah, I think someone once said that if that breaks down, that will be a vomiting camel. So that's yeah. the head and that's the hump. And then if it breaks below, down we go. So again, you know, I think in Asia, some of the markets are looking a little bit tired, for want of a better word. And this, what you're seeing here is, what I, is, is a pause for breath. And I think if you break below 27,000 with any significant degree of impetus, then we could see a whole host of stocks stops triggered all the way down to 26,000. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, you know, for me, everyone saying well, stocks should go higher, so on and so forth. That may well be true, but certainly, I think in the context of what we've seen at the moment, there are there is some evidence that stocks are starting to look a little bit tired. We are in May, 
and I'm not a big believer in selling money and go away, but certainly looking at the FTSE 100 and the UK 100, again, we're right on this line. We did break below it earlier this month, but we didn't close below it. Um, but what we do appear to have is this is almost like a rounded top. It's not quite a head and shoulders. We've got a left shoulder here, a little bit of a head here, and a right shoulder here. When we rallied post-election on Friday, what we didn't do with any degree of uh, confidence is to basically take out that March peak in May. We went slightly above it, but we didn't close conclusively above it. So there's certainly some evidence of a little bit of a topping pattern there. But we still have very, very solid support at the 200-day moving average and at the trend line support that we tested earlier this morning. Okay, ladies and gents, um, I'm going to wind this up now unless you have any other questions you'd like to direct to me or Colin. If you do want to follow up on anything that we've discussed in this um, Q&A, please feel free to tweet us. I'm at mhewson underscore cmc. Colin is at csuzinski underscore cmc. Don't ask me to spell his name because I can't. Um, <laughs> sorry, Colin. Um, no problem. But yeah, but, but please feel free to either you know, or either that or, or drop us an email. Otherwise, um, thanks very much for your time. We'll talking to you again. Non-farm payrolls in June. That should be interesting. Um, otherwise, if we don't speak to you on farm payrolls in June, we'll talk to you same time, same place next month. Absolutely. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, guys.